Well, that was silly. Larry O'Connor show, Subaru Live Stage. See, I didn't hear the cue properly. That's the problem. I'm, I'm a radio guy. I've never been on stage in theater, unlike Gary Sinise. Uh, we were talking about all the projects you've worked on, but every, you heard it as soon as you got here. Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan, no matter what movie you do, whatever series you do, that character will always be connected. But I got to think, you know, every actor sometimes has that defining role. Not a bad role to be defined by, I would think, though. You, oh, no. you sort of embrace it. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've gotten used to it, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the movie's 25 years old this year. Oh, wow. 25 amazing? years ago, uh, this summer, July 6th, the movie came out in 1994. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I write about this in my book uh, about the Vietnam veterans in my family and and the impact that uh, they had on me and uh, the, the work that I'd done in the 70s and 80s kind of supporting local Vietnam veterans groups in Chicago and, and then in the 90s getting to play a Vietnam veteran and, and yeah. the impact that that made on me and the impression it made on me and the, the work I started doing with our wounded at that time because he was a wounded soldier. Mm -hmm. I kind of document all that in the book. It's pretty pretty neat. So, yeah, your book, Grateful American, is a bestseller, and the response and reaction to it has been so phenomenal. And, and congratulations on that. It's well deserved. Hey, thanks. But uh, thank you. Thank you. You know what strikes me the most about the book, um, aside from the content of it, but the title, Grateful American, gratitude is a very important value, isn't it? It's a very important thing. And to and to just proclaim in the title of the book how grateful you are to be an American, I think that speaks a lot to your life's work. I, you know, I didn't know what the title of the book was going to be called when I started writing it. I was just writing the book. And then uh, as I started to rewrite the book and reread it and go through it bit by bit, uh, those themes of gratitude and appreciation and um, uh, my love for country, all of that, uh, love for our defenders, uh, that, all those themes just started to pop out at me in, in every chapter. And, and then I, I realized that the subtitle, A Journey from Self to Service, was exactly what the story was mm. because I decided initially I was going to document uh, on paper a lot of the military support that I've been involved with over the years. Yeah. But uh, then I decided, well, how did I get there? And so we went back and sort of tracked that. And then it, I realized this is exactly what the story is, is, is how I had a singular focus on kind of my acting and my theater career and my movie stuff and all of that. And you have to have that singular then, focus to, to really do it right and really make a career out of it, well, I think, at least at the beginning. That was, that was the self part of the mm -hmm. story, you know, just kind of focusing on my own kind of little thing that I wanted to do. And then post-September 11th, it turned into a broader focus of service. And and now it's a full-on full on mission with my own foundation. And, yeah. and that's all documented in the book. It sure is. And we Americans are grateful for that mission that you've been on. And you, you really are a hero to so many of us. We're going to get into more of what Gary Sinise has done. But I also want to go back to the early days that you document in your book. I think it's inspiring uh, for many parents whose children might want to take that path to go into the arts uh, because that freaks a lot of us parents out. But uh, <laughs> but you're a good example, I think, of what, what can be done in this business. We're going to get into all of that, the book, the foundation, your work with the troops, and uh, this guy over here, John Andrasik, who is, uh, is a pretty good opening act for Lieutenant Dan Band these days. <laughs> you know, you could do worse. All that and more are coming up here on the Larry O'Connor Show. Yeah. Here we are. Larry O'Connor Show. You know, They've been applauding all through the break. It's amazing. We now have to quiet them down. We're live here at the Subaru Live stage, uh, and we've got Gary Sinise and John Andrasik, Five for Fighting. You know, the whole Five for Fighting thing, see, I always thought this was like the name for the group, but it's actually you. You are it. You are Five for Fighting. For better right? or worse. That's just yeah. weird. There's no band. So it's yeah. like a stage name. Well, it is a stage name. Not a it band is, name. It is a stage name, but I've worked with some incredible musicians for the last 10 years, just like Gary, as you know, our bandmates become our family. Yeah. And uh, I've been fortunate to work with some amazing, not just rock players, but string quartet, 
quartet players and fantastic musicians around the world. Yeah. yeah. And and you will be the opening act for Lieutenant Dan Band in Thousand Oaks. And I, I can't mention it enough, the Gary Sinise Foundation. This is the concert for Defenders. Um, and it's going to be April 13th, 2019. And uh, this is really for the people of Ventura County and, and everyone who's been dealing with the uh, hardships uh, over the last several months, years, really. Yeah, I, I, I live up in that area. And uh, after the shooting and then the fires and uh, all the terrible things that hit the community out there. Um, I just wanted to do something to bring the community together. So I asked uh, the folks at Cal Lutheran if they can give me the football stadium. And, <laughs> and so we're going to do I it. Lo I love how you stadium. think so small. Yeah, I want to do something. <laughs> Let's find a football stadium. Well, you know, I wanted to make it uh, free for everybody. So it's a free concert. Uh, we did a, a concert for Defenders uh, about 18 months ago at the LAVA, another free concert uh, just to celebrate our first responders and our veterans. And uh, so I thought, let's let's do another one at this time uh, to help, you know, just bring the community together in celebration of the first responders and in tribute to the, to the borderline families that uh, were affected. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible uh, one-two punch there, and so we're yeah. gonna we're gonna do something positive in the community. Then. That's April thirteenth at the William Rowland Stadium, California Lutheran University, in Thousand Oaks. Um, so I've got four kids. My two oldest are teenagers, uh, nineteen, seventeen. One is in UCLA. The next one is uh, going to be graduating this year from high school. And now uh, the oldest one wants to go into theater. She wants to be a professional stage manager in theater. My second oldest daughter um, is uh, got an appointment to the Naval Academy. So she's going to the to Annapolis, and she's going to become a naval officer. So I'm telling them, uh, you know, we're doing this event with Gary Sinise next week for the radio station. And my oldest said, oh, my God, that's the guy who started Steppenwolf Theater. And the next one said, oh, my God, that's Lieutenant Dan. So, so you're very big with both of those kids. Um, but let's talk about the Steppenwolf for a minute because everyone sees you as a movie star, TV star. They forget your incredible pedigree on stage. That's how I first saw you with that incredible production of Grapes of Wrath on Broadway oh. um, that was captured for uh, PBS as yeah. well, a beautiful yeah. film. But what? how did that journey, you talk about it in the book, you're a, a teenager in the in Chicago area and you and a bunch of friends decide, hey, let's let's start a theater. It's very Judy Garland and, and Mickey Rooney. Kind, kind of, yeah. I... Um... I really struggled a lot in school from an early age all the way through high school. And uh, music was something that I did uh, for fun. And uh, I, it was kind of the only thing that was keeping me going at that time. When I was a sophomore in high school, and then there's a story in the book of how I got into theater, which was by accident. The drama teacher just saw me in the hallway and told me to come and audition for West Side Story, you know, uh -huh. West Side Story, gang members fighting each so, other, and she thought I looked like one, so. So they needed people to uh, fill in the background yeah. for the Jets, basically. I, I, yeah, I was actually a shark. Oh, you were a uh, shark? I was a shark. I was. Yeah, I uh, can see the Puerto Rican there, can uh, you? I was yeah. a shark. <laughs> So again, and, was, back then it was okay to do. Uh, yeah, okay. right. well, it was non-traditional casting, I think is what they call yeah, it. That's right. <laughs> and, well, this is 1971, back in, in wow. the early 70s. So you danced. And, well, I did then in that, in that <laughs> show. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I tried, and, and I just fell in love with it. Yeah. I mean, it changed my life. It changed the whole course of what I was doing in school. I was really a, just about to get kicked out of school. Mm. I, I know it. And all of a sudden I found this drama department, and I just wanted to go do plays all the time. And... Uh, I, I didn't want to go to college. High school was hard enough. So <laughs> as soon as I graduated from high school, I started a theater company. And now we're like 45 years old now. We just last week broke ground on another building. We have like four buildings. Uh, we built two of them from the ground up, and we're about to build another one there. That's so amazing. It's, it's a pretty incredible story well, started by 18-year-old kids. And you put Chicago Theater really on the map. I mean, it would be for that. Uh, it was a touring town. The big tours would come in, but between uh, what you did at Steppenwolf and the Goodman Theater and a couple of the other smaller regional theaters that started, Chicago is incredible now. I mean, it's it's one of the most prominent yeah, theater towns Ma in the country. Yeah, Mamet uh, started there, and uh, you Greg know, Mosier, the great director. Joe, Greg Joe Montaigne, mm -hmm. uh, organic. Well, theater. well, and who were those teenagers that you started Steppenwolf with? Uh, Malkovich was one of them. Uh, I tell some pretty funny stories about him in the yeah. book. That, he's that, he's that, insane, uh, isn't he? Yeah. He's a crazy guy. 
That John Malkovich, he's crazy. He's got his own reality. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now here's what I'm interested in. Gary Sinise, no good Nick in high school, starts doing West Side Story, uh, you know, dancing and prancing and singing on the stage, and now wants to forego college and start a theater company. How's that conversation go with your dad? Oh, my dad was just glad I had something to do. Hey, that's, that's it. I mean, like I said, I was really I was struggling. My dad was working all the time. He was a film editor in Chicago. And, uh, in fact, he was one of the – I write about him in the book. And uh, one of the very first independent film editing companies in Chicago was his company. He's actually in the, in the Chicago Editor's Hall of Fame for starting an independent uh, editing firm about 1960. Oh, wow. So he, but he was all, that was the Mad Men time, the advertising world and everything. So he was gone from 7 a.m. until 1 in the morning. I, I never saw my dad uh, very much. He was always working. So I was getting into all kinds of trouble. And uh, then I discovered theater and I was doing plays and I was good at it. And my parents were just, just happy. I found something that I was good at. And, you know, to find something that you love, like John, same thing for for John, you know, find something that you love when you're so young that you can kind of go off and make a living at and be successful at. That's 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 rare. I mean, a lot of a lot of people search for that for a long time. I was lucky that I found it. Well, and 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 we're lucky that you found it, by the way, because you've brought so many memorable performances. And and if I can just you know tie this little segment up with my own opinion. Uh, you know, a lot of us watch television, a lot of us watch films and theater and your music, and we don't always see our values reflected on the screen, and it frustrates us. And, and you know, when we watch the Oscars, we're hearing people lecture to us about our politics, and, and, and we want to go to a time when it's just about the work, it's just about the show, it's just about the film. But, you know, a part of that is because... Sadly, I think a lot of dads, when their kid comes to them and says, I want to be an actor, I want to be a writer, I want to be a director, we say, well, no, you're going to get a real job. You know, you're going to, you're going to work on Wall Street or be a lawyer because, you know, we need more people or lawyers, right? And, and I think when someone, when a kid is raised with good American values for uh, gratitude for this nation and, and respect for our country and respect for the values that we all share, and then they go into whatever industry they go into, they're going to they're gonna help that industry reflect those values. And if it's the arts and if it's the culture, if it's the entertainment industry, they're going to take those values to the job. And so it's incumbent on us as parents to help our kids uh, really progress in the arts and in the entertainment industry. And that's just me on my soapbox. I know you guys so. but uh stop getting angry at hollywood start helping hollywood get some better ideas and that starts with our kids larry o'connor show kbc oh. yeah. you betcha we're live at the super live stage i you know we we're just talking this is the uh third month of this uh, brand new program this concept where i'm in washington dc some of the time i'm here in la but i really feel like uh, today i'm part of the kbc family by being able to get this show on the subaru live stage so grateful that you're all out here and uh, very grateful to john andrasic and gary sinise for joining me Thanks. here we've we've known each other for several years and and run into each other at things and you guys also know ben shapiro who's our three to six host we've got your shot at a pair of tickets to see ben shapiro at the reagan library for a lecture and book signing on Tuesday, March 19th. This event is sold out, but we've set aside a few pair of tickets just for KBC listeners. All you got to do is listen to Ben's keyword during the show 3 to 6 starting this week, then listen for the cue to call during the 7 a.m. hour with John Phillips and Jillian Barbary. First caller to give them the keyword. This is very complicated, isn't it? Give them the keyword, stand on one foot, rub your belly and pat your head, and you want a pair of tickets to Ben Shapiro at the sold-out Reagan Library. Listen to Ben between 3 to 6 for the keyword. Good luck from AM790. KBC. I want to remind you again that this uh, uh, performance, uh, the Concert for Defenders, is April 13th, William Rollins Stadium at California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks. Go to GarySiniseFoundation.org to get all the information. And let's talk a little bit, Gary, about the foundation, because what started as uh, you wanting to do whatever you can to help our first defenders, uh, to help our troops to travel and, and bring them a little bit of taste uh, from home uh, when they're serving in, in combat, that's now become a really major foundation. I mean, you guys do incredible work, and and I I, I really want you to sort of talk about how you've been able to provide homes for people. Uh, you know, we've got our, our veterans. 
it's amazing our enemy is so diabolical and they create these horrible explosive devices that are designed to inflict as much pain and create as much damage to our incredible uh, troops. And they, because our medical uh, personnel are so good, they're not left to die on the field anymore. They are saved, their lives are saved, but their lives are completely turned upside down without limbs, with severe brain damage. And, and your foundation is there to help them transition back into life, into into really being a whole man. It's incredible. Well, we're uh, we're trying to do as much good in, in uh, as many spaces as as possible. I, as I said, when I uh, played Lieutenant Dan in Forrest Gump, he's a wounded Vietnam veteran, and uh, that started me uh, working with our wounded through the Disabled American Veterans Organization. So, twenty five year relationship with the DAV and after September 11th and the deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan people started getting hurt we started losing them uh, I just uh, I volunteered for the USO and I raised my hand uh, for several military charities out there trying to to support them in different ways just so we could cover more ground help more people and after so many years of doing that so many travels of entertaining and you know doing things, I started my own foundation. One of the things that I had been doing before the foundation is raising money to build specially adapted homes for our badly wounded service members. Yeah. And uh, so once the foundation got going, I wanted to make home building a, 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 a part of that. So we have a program at the foundation. It's in the book uh, called Rise, Restoring Independence, Supporting Empowerment. That's, uh, you know, you you're missing both your arms, both your legs. You have a traumatic brain injury. You're burned. You're blind. Whatever it is, uh, terrible injuries. The, you lose your independence. And but and these men are superheroes. They are. They're real life superheroes. They are physical specimens. They are capable of doing so much with such incredible courage. And then this happens to them, and it's such a blow to their psyche. But but being able to provide them a home that they can live in with their families, it's its so important for them as fathers, isn't it? I mean, see, we, we actually just, just this morning, a couple hours ago, we gave away another house in uh, in Texas to a double amputee, uh, West Point graduate, huh. um, served his country, and uh, his family now has a brand new home. It's uh, I think we're up to over 70 houses wow. right now for our wounded. All right, uh, we'll be back here uh, as we continue to explore uh, Gary Sinise, the man, the American, and the actor, John Andrasik, the really cool dude that sings great songs. Oh, you're a pretty cool guy. I mean, you know, but you're not. <laughs> really cool dude who sings Go That's Kings right. Go. That's in his writer, Larry O'Connor's show, KBC. <laughs> you bet it is. And uh, we got Gary Sinise, John Andrasik. If this sounds like, by the way, just some fanboy who's just thrilled to have Five for Fighting and Gary Sinise, Lieutenant Dan, sitting here, you're right. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> and uh, and to that, and can you guys stick around for a little while longer? You know, sure. just just for yeah, a bit. Sure. John, you got another song in you? Sure, buddy. Yeah. All yeah. right. Sure. If you guys want. Yeah. All right, we got one more song. Uh, in a minute, we're going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit more. Um, I, I want to know, actually, real fast, have you considered going back to the stage and doing some more theater? Because it's been a while since you've you've done Broadway. It's uh, last. Last thing I did was right before September 11th. So, I, I, yeah, it it would all depend on what it is. I can't say yes. I can't say no. I'm busy right now and doing a lot of things. See, to me, I want to go through every old Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart movie and see, you know, what, whatever those movies are, adapt them to the stage and put Gary Sinise in there. <laughs> and it would just be, it would kill. I always thought you'd be great in Mr. Roberts. I think that would be. Uh, I've actually right? looked at that. Yeah. Did you really? Did we you consider did, that? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And didn't work out. No, no. I mean, it's a very big, big show. There's like 40 people in that show. I know, I know people. We get that done. All right. Uh, we'll be back here for the next hour with Gary Sinise, John Andrasi from the Subaru Live Stage, Larry O'Connor Show on AM 790 KABC. Don't forget to eat your pie. Everybody have your pie. From Bristol Farms. And we are live at the Zuber Live stage with Gary Sinise, John Androsik, and a whole crew of very lucky VIP KBC listeners who got to come out here, battle the traffic. As that's the tough thing about being on at 10 a.m. You got to get through that rush hour traffic to get to our show. But you got your pie from Bristol's Farms. Happy Pie Day, everybody. 
And uh, we are so thrilled to be able to bring you this very special broadcast. Thank God, you know, I t- totally knew that today was the day the Mueller report was going to drop. You know, we were going to have to do all that kind of. But thank God, not a whole lot of news. So we're we're enjoying our conversation about, frankly, things that are bigger than the daily headlines. I always like to talk about how you know what happens in our house is more important than what happens in the White House. That the way we're raising our kids and the way that we're looking after our families and our neighborhoods and our communities really ultimately is going to make a bigger difference in our lives than who happens to win an election every four years. And, and honestly, I think the work that you guys do uh, with, your, uh, with your music, with your acting, and then the work outside of that, the volunteer work, it reflects that. That you're, you know, you're going to help the troops, uh, Gary and John, no matter who the president is, no matter who the commander-in-chief is, because the men who wear the uniform, they're the ones who are getting it done. And I so respect that, and I thank, thank you for you. it. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about the events. With the, the feedback that you get, uh, uh, John, when you're singing for the troops, when they're, you know, th- that's your audience, right? And it always astounds me how grateful they are to you. It's so ridiculous that they're thanking you for being there, considering what they're doing for us. You know, me and Gary talk about this a lot. You know, it's like um, they should be the ones signing autographs for us. Right. And, uh, but you understand that, you know, People enjoy films, they enjoy music, and they like meeting the people that create those. And we do live in such a shallow celebrity culture, sometimes everything's flipped. But, um, but we see, as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is all we can do, you know, and we want to be part of the effort. When we see an event like uh, Borderline, like, we just reflect the community. We're helpless, we're sad, we're crying, our hearts are broken. So what can we do? Well, maybe we could put on a show, maybe mm-hmm. we could raise some money maybe we could recognize some people maybe we should we could give a hug um and so for us that's you know i think we wish we could do more but this is our part to serve and to support our troops and their families and uh i don't want to embarrass him but you know gary is kind of uh, you know it's been said but in my mind he is our generation's bob hope and Mm -hmm. he does it the right way and we've been doing this so long you know it's one thing when you're in front of the cameras but when you you spend hours in vans and airports and and planes, you get to know the person and the people, and it's, and I think Gary reflects hundreds of celebrities and artists. One that's actually going to be on the air in an hour on your station, Leanne Tweeden, yep. who was part of many of Gary's first USO trips and has done many events with us. So I think you know, you know, Gary's the face of it, but there's folks like Leanne and many musicians and many that you don't know, many local musicians or or actors who will come and play a vet's you know Sunday night dinner. And uh, I think that's just, uh, you don't hear about that stuff, but in a cynical world, know that there's a lot of people doing a lot of great stuff for our troops, and they do appreciate it. And uh, I think it's a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, and it's nice to see. And, and you know, you mentioned Bob Hope. Gary, this, is, this was, used to be the norm in Hollywood, right, especially during World War II, Korean War. Um, it, was, it was just expected for people in Hollywood to, to give back and to do something for our American heroes overseas. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that you, you picked that up. Somebody needed to. You were the right man in the right place. Well, uh, as, as I said earlier, um I think with the veterans in my family, uh, many veterans going back to World War One and World War Two, Korea era, then... Jeez, this the, does sound like Lieutenant Dan. I mean, it, there really are parallels there, aren't there? A little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that funny part in the movie where all his relatives <laughs> were serving, yeah. But then when I met my wife and she introduced me to her brothers, two who served in Vietnam and then her sister... Mm. served in the army married a vietnam veteran uh combat medic in vietnam it it was really the vietnam veterans that started me thinking back in the 70s and 80s i was uh, i graduated high school in 1973 that was the end of combat operations in vietnam Uh, but i had to register for uh, the draft and selective service my parents were very nervous about it. it was a really tricky and terrible time for our vietnam veterans coming home and having so many personal relationships with them when we started deploying to iraq and afghanistan uh knowing what had happened to our vietnam veterans when they came home from war a divided Mm -hmm. nation over whether they should be there or not i didn't want that to happen to our uh, current active duty troops responding to the attacks of september 11th so 
that's what motivated me to start going, and then I just kept going. You know, that, that I, I want to bring it back to Lieutenant Dan for a minute, and I'm sorry to keep doing this to you, but it is such a defining role, and I think that the, the message is so important because I mean, when you got that script and you got to read the journey, the story arc, that Lieutenant, this is a supporting role in this big film, but my God, it's, 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 it's a, a story unto itself. Uh, uh, aside from the Forrest Gump character, when you got to see that story arc and, and the journey that that character uh, goes through and the redemption that he feels, and, that, and that, the scene on the shrimp boat in the storm, I mean, it's almost Shakespearean, like a, K, a King Lear screaming at the Tempest, right? Uh, did you know the moment you read that script that this was going to be one of those parts? Well, I, uh, I reacted favorably to it, yes, of course. <laughs> I, I had, uh, as I said, because of the Vietnam connection and the work that I'd done in the 80s with Vietnam veterans, I, I track a lot of the, those early seeds that were planted for what I'm doing today uh, in the book. Uh, yeah. There's a lot about uh, how my work with Vietnam veterans in the 80s sort of set the stage for what I'm doing today. When I had the opportunity to audition for a Vietnam veteran in the 90s, uh, I very much wanted to do it. Uh, felt it was in some ways, uh, you know, destined to get it. I was lucky to get it. Uh, and little did I know at the time that uh, Lieutenant Dan would play kind of a bigger role in my life than just, uh, you know, setting the stage for a pretty good movie career. It really... <laughs> Uh, it really did so much more for me than yeah. than that, and has played a role in the current the work that I do today with our veterans. Yeah, and and I've seen the films of you performing overseas, and the they they'll shout Lieutenant. They, they you get up on stage, and they all shout Lieutenant Dan at you, and that yeah. that, <laughs> that that character means something to them. It really does. I mean that they that that <clears throat> it's part of their their childhood. It's part of their I've growing up. I've done I uh, my. Uh, Chief Executive Officer at my foundation yesterday told me that I've done, uh, since 2003, I've done 460 concerts wow. for, for the military. And at, at so many of them, uh, I, they'll be out there and they, they, they'll be shouting that at me. And so I'll ask everybody, you know, there'll be thousands of people out there and I'll ask them you know, how many people have seen Forrest Gump and the whole crowd cheers and Man. raised their hands. And, and then I'll ask, you know, is there anybody over 10 that hasn't seen the movie? And, and, and it's very quiet. <laughs> Nobody says it. It's amazing how the movie just keeps, it's in the consciousness all the time because it's always on television, it seems. Mm -hmm. And people in new generations of Folks are seeing the film again. We are in the 25th anniversary. They're talking about doing a big event for the 25th anniversary. So it, it, it just has remained. It's one of those movies that kind of remains. And, you know, I was, I was lucky to be in that. Uh, we're, so obviously, we're speaking with Gary Sinise and John Andrasik, and uh, I want to again mention your concert coming up on April 13th at California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks. It's a uh, concert for defenders, uh, hashtag Ventura Strong. Go to GarySiniseFoundation.org to get all the information. You mentioned your wife. This is another anomaly about you, Gary Sinise, as an actor in Hollywood. Uh, you're married to the same person since, what, 1981, I think? And you've got a strong, happy family. It appears. I don't want to presume. Every family has its issues. But that's not easy in this town. Uh, did you? It, it, was it hard for you? Or or is your is your wife in the business? Uh, she's an uh, original member of Steppenwolf. Oh, Steppenwolf? Steppenwolf. That's, My God, that's where you we met. married I, one of your... your co-creators yeah. of Steppenwolf? Oh, yeah. I, I met her. She Man. went to college with my best friend, uh, Jeff Perry, uh, who went to Illinois State University, and that's where I first met her at college. And then she became an original member of Steppenwolf, and then we got together. Uh, you know, we got married about five years after we got that started. But in the book, I, you know, we've been through many, many challenges in our in our life and relationship with and with. Uh, different difficulties that we've had and some of that is documented in the book because some of it was going on at a time where everything appeared to be just rosy uh, mm -hmm. with the the movie career ascending and everything but at home we were we were facing some real challenges and so I wanted people to understand that the part of the journey 
to service uh, was was fraught with some some bumps. Well, along and the, way. The, the book is Grateful American from self to service journey from self to service, and part of that journey involved a faith journey uh, where you you've been very open about your conversion to Catholicism. Uh, talk a little bit about how that was. Where did you have a faith before, or were you were you raised? You know, I was. Uh, I uh, went to Sunday school till I was about six years old, and then I uh, wasn't really raised with anything. My uh, my, I, I talk about my great grandparents in, in the book. They came over from Italy, very Catholic, um, and then had had nine kids. And my grandfather <laughs> Sounds was pretty one Catholic, of them. Yeah. yeah, my 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 grandfather was one of them, and then he so he was Catholic, but then he married a. a Presbyterian and uh, the, the oh his his father was <laughs> was not happy and you know it's, so uh, they didn't really raise my parents with with that much and and my parents didn't really raise us with that much it was it was during some uh, some times during the nineties when uh, we kind of discovered that my wife decided that she wanted to go back to her Catholic roots. Because uh, same thing happened in her family. Her, her mom was Catholic. Her dad was Methodist, and you know they, they, she wasn't raised with anything. But she went back uh, to the church, and uh, our family followed. And uh, it was very, very. Uh, it was such a, a hopeful thing and a helpful thing uh, to us th- uh, through some very, very challenging times in our life. Yeah, I bet. Um, and and you know it's it, you. I, you don't come across all the time as sort of someone who wears their emotion on their sleeve. You know, your 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 I think your stage persona and your screen persona is very much this the stoic everyman who sort of endures. But uh, you went viral recently with a video yeah. when they presented this this video of everyone thanking you and honoring you and uh, Tom Hanks, and it, it was it was connected with your. Your, the launch of your book, and boy, it really hit you, didn't it? I mean, that was an amazing thing to see. Uh, so what, <laughs> what Larry's talking about is uh, on the day that my book launched, February 12th, uh, my office, uh, my chief executive officer, who's uh, a retired uh, four-star uh, in, from the Air Force, uh, been a very good friend of mine since he was a colonel, um, and my team there, they were very sneaky behind my back, and they rallied a whole bunch of different people to send in videos. Uh, and they put this montage of videos together, kind of, you know, uh, expressing gratitude uh, for what I'd been doing for the veterans and, and our troops and appreciation and, and uh, just acknowledgement and all of that. And they sprung it on me on the day they that the book launched I was just in the middle of doing interviews. And and you they, cried like a little girl, didn't you? <laughs> they sat me down in front of the laptop, and uh, I was very, <laughs> I was w- pretty weepy about it. It was a great thing to very see. Very touching. And and yeah. then, of course, they were, they were <clears throat> sneaky times 10, because then they took a video of Gary watching it. <laughs> Getting emotional, and that just went all over social media. It's, uh, but but I got emotional watching it too because I think you you don't realize how many people you've touched with the work that you've done. I think, and how much people admire you. I, I tell my peers and my friends that we were doing this show today, and they said that guy's my hero. And I know that I know that sounds weird because we know who the real heroes are, but uh, <clears throat> but I think it's important, especially considering the name of your book, Grateful American, that you know that we Americans are pretty grateful for what you've done for us. Thank so, you, thank, thank you, you, Gary Sinise. John, what do you think? Uh, good time for a song? Uh, sure. <laughs> That velvet voice. We're taking John a little out of the element with the guitar. I'm sorry about that because he's such a phenomenal piano player. I'm 15 for a moment, caught in between 10 and 20, and I'm just dreaming. Count the ways to where you are I'm 22 for a moment And she feels better than ever We're on fire Making our way back from Mars In 15 there's still time for you Never wish better than thee. 
when you only got a hundred years to live. I'm 33 for a moment. I'm still the man, but you see I'm a dead kid on the way. Family on my mind. The sea is high We're heading into a crossing Chasing the years of our life Fifteen, there's still time for you Time to buy, time to lose yourself Into a morning star Never a wish better than this When you only got a hundred years To live half time goes by Suddenly you're wise Another blink of an eye 67's gone, the sun is getting high We're moving on We're moving on, Gary I'm 99 for a moment I'm dying for just another moment And I'm just dreaming Counting the ways to where you are In 15 there's still time for you 22 I feel you too 33 you're on your way Every day's a new day now There's never a wish better than this Better than this When you only got a hundred years to live Yeah, hundred years. Hundred years, five for fighting. That's John Andrasik, Gary Sinise. Don't forget the Concert for Defenders with both those guys and a whole lot more. It's April 13th at William Rollins Stadium, California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks. Doors are going to open at 4 o'clock. It's free, but go to GarySinisFoundation.org to just click on the links and let them know you're coming. A little bit more here from the Subaru Live Stage coming up on the Larry O'Connor Show, KABC. We're live at the Subaru Live Stage here, 1135 on AM790 KBC. And I want to give you all a heads up. Here's the deal. I let John, I'm going to take you everywhere I go. Like, you know, riding on the metro in D.C. It's Laura yeah. O'Connor. Come on, let's hear it. Hey, they, don't, they don't recognize me there. Uh, and speaking of that, now I don't want to give you a heads up because, first of all, y'all are so lucky you have no idea because usually these Subaru live stage things, I don't want to disparage my colleagues on KBC, but they'll do one hour and then they're done. You know, they go across the street, go back to the studio. You're getting a bonus hour here, two hours here from the Subaru live stage. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but afterwards, usually there's a lot of glad handing and chat. I got to I got to go. You know, I do this show in D.C. and I do it right after this show. So I got to go right into a studio there because because they're very they're very uptight in Washington, D.C. And you can't you can't miss anything. Uh, John Andrasik is here with us. And you just mentioned now I'm going to pull on this thread and, and it's up to you if you want to allow me to or sure. not. You just mentioned something when I said you want to run for office and you said, well, I can't in California. You know how I am. You, I've I've seen your Twitter feed. You you go to social media. You're you're kind of outspoken. Try not to. No, no, yeah. you have. You you yeah. you you make comments now and again about politics. About not not specifically parties necessarily. Also, sometimes you do. But you've criticized Saturday Night Live for not being funny anymore because they're just it's it's just become a political mess. This is a this is something that you're pretty outspoken about. Well, we had a friend back in the day, uh, Mr. Breitbart, who. Uh, was a good friend of both of us and had a good insight into what you talk about a lot about culture being downstream from politics. Yeah. And what people don't realize about Andrew was he wasn't really a political guy. He was no. just a guy that kind of had a, a value and, and a, an innate sense of fairness. And, uh, and yeah, I think like many of us, we're frustrated about the tribes. And uh, you have to be in one or the other. And uh, certainly in, in the entertainment business, it's, it's usually the other. Yeah. But... Um, but no, I think most folks, uh, as you said earlier, most folks are good folks. And uh, whatever side of spectrum you're on and 
we, we want the same results. And Andrew yeah. knew that too. Yeah. I'm so glad you, you raised yeah. Andrew. That's how John yeah. and I first met was yeah. we both knew Andrew early on in the days. Yeah. And um, it's so funny. You know, I remember when Tucker Carlson started The Daily Caller, yeah. um, Andrew said, this is great because he'll, he'll do D.C. and I'll stay here in Hollywood yeah. and I'll deal with the culture and he'll deal with politics and we'll meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, he never had any intention of making uh, uh, the Breitbart sites be so D.C. centric. You know, he, he, that bored him. Who won the nomination bored him. Who won the election bored him. It was about this other stuff. And that's why he liked you so much, by the way. Well, thanks. Again, I, I think, you know, Twitter and all that stuff can really be toxic, and I think you think, and, and I think you know, I'm trying to wean myself off, but I think a lot of the stuff is common sense, and and certainly uh, my political views tend to be a little more centrist than most most of the folks in, in this business. But I've had um, great conversations with um, some of the leading Broadway folks that we all well, look up to. I know and, we we yeah, we both yeah. we both know each other and yeah. and, and have. Yeah. Similar friends and acquaintances in the theater business, and I remember you reached out to me and said, "You know, these guys aren't well nearly it, as crazy the, as well, I thought." At the, of, at the end of the day, we want the same things. Yeah. We may have different strategies to get there, but the problem is, is you can't have those conversations anymore, and that's what frustrates me the most. Yeah, um, you either, you know, you it's it's all out warfare, and what gets lost in that are practical solutions. So again, I'm, uh, you know, I try to to stay out of some of the the firing ranges and and some of the stuff, but. Because you know, at the end of the yeah. day, the work is the most important thing. And I do believe in the entertainment business that if you're talented and you do the work, you will be rewarded uh, if the if the breaks go your way. Well, yeah, it's so much about luck, yeah. <laughs> you know, and being in the right place at the right time. It's not, you know, unlike sports where if you're Michael Jordan, you're going to play. If you're Wayne Gretzky, you're going to play. You know, you could be Leonard Cohen, who most people don't know, and one of the greatest songwriters of all. And if the stars don't line up, you may have to get a real job. <laughs> and uh, we talked about our kids going into the arts. And, you know, my mom was a music teacher. I was Tony in West Side Story because they cut funding to L.A. City schools. And she said, I'll go put on the musicals. And she put on the musicals. Wow. You know, my dad was very supportive. Oh, so wait, so you yeah. only got the part because your mom was the director? Is of that what course. you're saying? It was like the ping pong coach at <laughs> UCLA. It's that nepotism yeah. again. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. No, yeah, it's like, take it if you can get it. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, so, so you know, my daughter is waiting to hear the audition results for her musical theater auditions. You know, my son has all of a sudden found passion for the guitar. So, you know, we think about family and the arts and the practical world we live in. And yeah. there's no great answers. And my dad was smart. I mean, he supported me. But, you know, he's like, all right, you know, get a math degree because then you can get a job. So, yeah. so that's what we did in that in that neck of the woods. But, but uh, yeah, the arts are crucial. And I think... Um, we get so lost in the celebrity culture and the tabloids. We need songs. We need songwriters to make money. We need, you know, we need um, the arts to not be a hobby. And for a while in the music industry, I was really worried with all the money coming out of the music industry that uh, it's important to have songs. They document our history. They document our times. You see what a song like Superman can mean to people. And uh, I think we forget about the arts, especially on this side of the aisle. We basically seed it. To the uh, to the other side. Are the barriers for entry for a young artist now in the music industry a lot easier? A lot. So, I mean, because because of social media, because of YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. and because of the instant money that you can make on downloads, you don't even need a label really anymore, right? It, that's that's actually quite a, it's a liberating different. thing. I mean, I mean, the, the the days of tour support are gone, and and uh, most labels are kind of superstars. And uh, sometimes, you know, you need two or three records to break. And, uh, and so that kind of has gone away. And you're right. Uh, everybody can hear you now. You can get 50,000 views on YouTube, and you can uh, sell 500 tickets, and you can do it your own way. You can make your record on your laptop. Yeah. So uh, there's certainly more opportunity. Um, but again, it's how do you make a living at it. And uh, and that's what you always think about for your kids. Uh, uh, the Gosnell film. Uh, yeah. We've had Nick Searcy, the director, and one of the yeah. co-stars on it. I've mm -hmm. interviewed Dean Cain. Andrew Claven wrote the yeah. script. And um, Annie, uh, uh, Annie, uh, Annie McElhaney, yeah. uh, one of the producers, I just interviewed her at CPAC last week. And she said, you know, John, John wrote a wonderful song right. for, lovely. for our, our yeah. show. And, and that movie, it's, I mean, it's such a heartbreaking movie about um, this horrible mass murderer, this yeah. abortionist. and. Philadelphia, um, but your song is incredibly moving and oh. and hopeful. I think, it, and it's the perfect song for the end of that film during the titles. Um, did how important was that for you to be a part of that project, considering the message? Actually, that came from Andrew. I mean, I really? met them at a party at uh, Sorbo's house with Andrew, 
and they were talking about some of the films they were making. They were actually talking about doing Gosselin at the time. And I said, well, if you ever need an end title, you know, reach out to me. And I, I wanted, you know, I took my time with that song because um, I wanted it to, um, to reflect the best I could the reality of, of, of that tone and that sentiment and Gosnell and, and the horror that that was. Um, but I also wanted it to kind of speak for the voices of the innocents, and that's why it's called Song of the Innocents. Yeah. And uh, kudos to them to get that movie made. I mean, you know how hard it is. Yeah. And it took them two or three years just to get it seen. Enormous so, resistance. Talk about running the marathon and fighting the good fight, and I know they're doing some other projects, maybe about a friend of ours, Mr. Reagan, that I'm excited about. Ooh. And uh, so, yeah, it's always nice. It's nice to do, it's nice to have commercial success because then it allows you to do passion projects, stuff like that. Well, I that. was going to say, it sounds yeah. like you're in a position right now where you can sort of make these decisions because of who you are, what you believe. I mean, I'm not saying that's all you do. Obviously, commercial success is important as well, but it's kind of nice to be in that place, I would think. Yeah, I mean, I think it's similar to Gary. It's like for so long, in, you know, as you're up and coming and you're kind of trying to pursue your lifelong passion, and I was a 20-year overnight success. You know, <laughs> it took me 20 years to actually make a penny at this business. You know, it's really hard to say no because your whole life you've been saying yes, 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 yes because you're afraid the whole house of cards will collapse. Right. But, but then, you know, you get to a point in your life, well, maybe I can say no and be a little more selective in what I want to do and spend my time inside of music and outside of music. I do a lot of stuff now with our family business that's... Uh, it's been in Los Angeles since the 40s, so I'm, I'm working I, I with want, my dad. Yeah, and, in yeah. fact, if we could, and yeah. a lot of people don't know this. I mean, obviously, everyone knows of you as a singer-songwriter and yeah. musician, but you're huge on entrepreneurship. In a way, mm. you know, you're you're an evangelist for entrepreneurship, yeah. and, and that's such a, an American value, I think, that is uniquely American. Can we talk about that a little bit in a moment? Sure. Because to me, you're sort of like the Mike Rowe of small business. You know <laughs> what I mean? And I love that about you. Yeah. So uh, a little bit more on that, because this is, again, these are things that we can bestow upon our children that... Uh, uh, th these are the things that do make America great. I, yes. I'm, I'm so sick of people looking at America as an ATM and that, that our whole job here is to just make as much money as we can. There's a whole lot more involved here, and entrepreneurship speaks to freedom. It speaks to to be able to call your own shots and be your own man, and that is uniquely American. Uh, we're going to get into that and much more as we continue our very special Larry O'Connor show here on 790 KBC. You betcha we're live from the Super Live stage. Hey, imagine Good Day LA, the Landmark TV news show, Uncensored. That's what you get with Jillian Barbary, Steve Edwards, Dorothy Lucy. They reunite to host the OKLA OK podcast. In fact, I think they're doing it right now in the studio across the street. It's one-of-a-kind fun, just like you loved it on Good Day LA. Download the latest OKLA OK podcast right now. It's free, and did I mention it's uncensored? They say naughty things. Download and subscribe now on iTunes. Tune in, and of course, kbc.com. Uh, I just want to take a quick moment here. Uh, these things do not happen by themselves. This is a huge event today, and I'm so impressed with the entire team here at KBC. Obviously, thank you to Gary Sinise, Greg Longstreet, John Androsik, our bosses, Drew and Don, who have made this happen. Thank you, Drew and Don. Uh, the K sure, let's hear it for them. They're the big cheeses, the suits. Uh, catering from Bristol Farms, our uh, production team, uh, Chuck I, Pierre, and Johnny. Is that Chuck Ide? Did I do that right? Ide or I? I, okay, just want to make sure. Uh, KBC Promotions, that's uh, Wendy, Cahal, and Patty, and the KBC Promo team, Chris, Fox, Juan, and Mike C. These are people that I'm still getting to know because I'm a newbie here, but thank you guys for making this happen. Uh, I keep saying it's literally a dream come true to be on KBC for me because as an Orange County kid going to Corona Del Mar High School, I would listen to this radio station. It was my radio station. I was a weird kid. I wasn't listening to Rick D's. I was listening to talk radio. So was I. And, yeah. uh, and this is yeah. where I am now, and I, and I love being part of this family and this legacy that is KBC for Southern California. Uh, uh, John, I, I just was able to speak at the Reagan Ranch last night to a bunch yeah. of high school kids. And I told them, you know, there's this thing going around that I don't think I put, we, we conservatives push back up enough on that the American dream is that our children have a better, more prosperous life than we did. Our founding fathers didn't set up a system like that. They weren't talking about that. Our founding fathers wanted to make sure that we handed a free nation to mm -hmm. the children uh, who are younger than us. If they end up being more prosperous, that's great. But this whole idea of U.S. A as an ATM, that that really the, the 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 amazing thing about America is that you can make as much money as you want. That's not a value. That's not a principle. That's not really. If my kids are are not as wealthy as me, but they're happy and they're good, upstanding Americans, and they love this country and they have a free nation to live in, I'll be a happy guy on my deathbed. And your evangelization, I will call it evangelizing, about entrepreneurship, family-owned businesses. 
that's that's part of that, I think. Your speeches are so powerful and so strong when you talk about this. It's not about being a corporate raider and making billions. It's about having that ownership value. You know, we, we talked earlier about the troops being the heart and spine of our country. I think family business, small business is the engine. Huh. And uh, I think freedom goes hand in hand with the American dream. And I've actually lived it. Uh, as I said, our family business, uh, Precision Wire Products, was uh, founded in the 40s um, by my grandfather. My dad left his job at JPL, NASA, in oh, the sure. 70s. Wow, literally a rocket scientist. He was an astrophysicist. Yes, wow. he was. And he actually, my grandfather passed away suddenly, and my dad kind of left uh, JPL to come run the family business. And has been doing so Did he do since. that thing when someone said, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist? And he said, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, try living with one. And, um, <laughs> I bet. And so, and I've been working with him my whole life. When I leave here today, I'll be heading to Commerce to our plant and, and working at Precision Wire. Our claim to fame is we make the best shopping cart in the world. And uh, so. We yes. need you on yes. that wall. Yes, yes. But um, it's really shown me firsthand uh, the American dream. I mean, the reality is we have about 300 employees. And many of them start at minimum wage. Uh, many of them don't speak English. And um, we, we, my dad has started this really cool tradition for Christmas parties. Um, when all the kids come, you know, if you have a 3.0 or better, you get like a gift card. And the kid, you know, at the age group that, that has the best grades maybe gets a laptop or an iPhone or something. Uh -huh. and, and we've been doing this for 20 years. And, and now those, you know, kids that uh, were kindergartners are now coming back from Harvard. Princeton, um, you know, lawyers, you know, you know, doctors, business people, entre entrepreneurs, and you know, their parents are now, you know, middle class, and so I've seen it firsthand. Yeah. And 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 I worry about kind of the the falling apart of of, of some of the small business and family businesses of, of the country. But true, truly, it is it is for me. It's a great passion. Uh, the family businesses, I think, uh, really hold us, you know, the farmers, Amen. you know, really hold us together. I agree. And I always, whenever I uh, get into a debate with somebody and they say, oh, you conservatives, you Republicans, you're all uh, pro-big business. I was like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not pro-corporation. I'm not pro-big business. I am pro-free market and I am pro-entrepreneurship. And sadly, these days, that isn't the same as being pro-business because the, the big businesses, they love getting in bed with the government and setting the rules so that they can succeed. And that sometimes squashes those family-owned businesses. So Yeah, we don't we, get the bailouts. No, we do not. No, we do not. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, that, but you're right. That is really what this country is yeah. all about. Uh, coming up, we're going to have a little uh, conversation with Dr. Drew and Leanne, and we'll hand it off to them. And uh, thank you again, John Androsik, for being here on our very special show. It means the world to me. Congrats yeah. on the show, Larry. Thank you. Yeah. It's the Larry O'Connor. Enjoy LA. Go on, Kings Go. On KBC. <laughs> Listen, uh, Dr. Drew and Leanne, before I, we get into this, I just want to thank a couple more people here. Our sponsors, Bristol Farms for the incredible coffee and pie for Pi Day, Hint Water for the beverages, Subaru, of course, for sponsoring the KLOS Subaru Live Stage, and, of course, Gary Sinise, John Andrasik for Five for Fighting, and Dino, our great producer, for keeping everything going here. Uh, what a special morning, guys. Thank you. And Leanne, thanks for swinging by and saying hi over here, too. You bet. We uh, it was a blast. What are you guys uh, going to talk about today? We got a professor from the graduate of education uh, at Harvard to talk about college admission scandals, and we have a Mike, Mike Paul is a reputation doctor to talk about what to do when you've been publicly shamed, and then we have Ann Coulter. Speaking of publicly shaming, well, the president recently publicly shamed her, actually. But yeah, you know what? Anne does not need any advice. She knows exactly how to push back. We love her. Uh, that's fantastic. Well, great. Have fun, you guys. By the way, Dr. Drew, do you, do you think the colleges had any kind of real awareness of what was going on here? Is there any way they didn't? Not the colleges, but I've spoken to some of my friends who are tenure professors and whatnot, and actually even people that have oversight of these uh, professions in the, in the athletic departments. They all said the same thing, which was these schools are way too driven by money that were patient. I'll say. Yeah. I'll say. That's for sure. All right. Looking forward to Dr. Drew and Leanne, as always, coming up next. And that's a wrap for this Larry O'Connor Show, but we'll see you back here tomorrow, as always, after Jillian and John at 10 a.m. on AM 790 KBC.